So uh, we're back to the world of medicine. So it is great pleasure to introduce to you uh, Dr. An um, Amanda Williams, who I met about 20 years ago when I was sent to a specialist pain unit as a neurologist uh, to learn how to manage pain. And she was truly inspirational. Um, so Amanda is a clinical psychologist and an academic who's got 30 years experience in the field of pain. And she's going to talk to you today about using your pain, uh, sorry, using your brain to tackle pain. It's too much for me. Um, so Amanda, welcome and thank you very much. Thanks, Ross, and thanks, everybody, and to the CTF for inviting me. It's really good to be here, and um, it's, uh, I'm, I'm learning a huge amount. Pain's a very odd area. It's a bit of an orphan in the area of medicine because um, it's not a disease. Uh, it's not a part of the body. It is, in a way, a system, but it's most pain care has grown up around... Uh, people who have been to all the specialists in diseases and parts of the body and nothing's been found and then uh, pain has grown up around trying to help them with, with you know, real problems around pain, many problems. Uh, in the last 10 years or so, there has been more of uh, that pain science and pain care extending back into disease areas where pain has been under-addressed or denied, um, or both. So uh, I think this is another area where, in pain, we don't tend to see many people with NF. And yet, uh, what, we, what we know from treating many people with pain is how much applies, really regardless of what diseases people have. Um, and it's much more about them as a person. And of course, Pain's invisible. It doesn't show up on scans. That would be like um, scanning a cable and expecting a cable to your television and expecting that the scan would show you the pictures and the words going through it. Of course, of course, it's not visible to those methods. So we very, very much have to work with what the patient says, what he or she describes. Um, how the pain has changed their lives in order to understand how to help. So I'm going to take you on a sprint through pain science and then talk about specific findings in NF. So pain is absolutely essential, much as we might want to be without it. These are the hands of a child with congenital insensitivity to pain. Fortunately, that's a rare disorder. Um, People born with insensitivity to pain rarely survive to adulthood because of the damage they do. Pain is a warning, and it warns us to withdraw from whatever is causing the pain, and we remember it, it, uh, it, uh, it grabs our attention, and um, so do the things around it grab our attention, and that helps us not make the same mistakes again as far as possible. And over the hours and days and weeks following a painful injury, of course. Pain makes sure we take care of ourselves and we attend to the injury and um, that also helps us remember. But of course, pain isn't always a warning. There are plenty of pains which we don't really understand why they happen. The kind of incidental headaches which many people have, the sort of uh, stomach aches that people have, we don't really think that those are injuries or disease. We accept that pains will happen um, without there always being a cause that should be fixed. Um, and that's because of the, the whole way the pain system works. Sorry, my picture's disappeared, so I... Uh, ah, thank you. So we're very efficient at feeling pain, but like many alarm systems, like our fire alarms, for example, 
um, they're set to be sensitive so we don't miss pain, but of course that sensitivity means they can go off when there actually isn't an alarm. There's something happening, but, but it isn't alarming, it isn't always a warning. But of course it's very hard to tell for yourself whether a pain is a warning or not, um, and the costs of missing it can seem so bad that that keeps grabbing your attention, making you think about it, and maybe talk to those around you about it, and then consult somebody. And pain does need to be dealt with collaboratively, very hard on your own. So this is um, just a, a real summary of the things that affect pain. And uh, on the right, you see chemical and structural things. And of course, those are very important. There have been huge, huge gains in pain science over the last 50 years when the model changed, really. Um, and that's where most of the research money goes. And remarkably little goes to these other areas of mood, context, cognitive set, what do you think, what do you feel, um, what your memories are of yourself, of your parents, of your grandparents and their pain. All those feed into your experience of pain. And you can see in the middle there's pain experience and there's a green arrow coming up. And that's bringing all the messages um, we just heard about uh, through, from the periphery and from your organs up to your brain. But at the same time, there are messages going down from your brain. Now, you all know if you're going to have a blood test or something, you hold your finger out, you know it's going to hurt a bit. You don't leap back when, <laughs> you know, when the blood test is, is done because it pricks, because you knew it. And your body actually prepared, your brain prepared your body not to react because you knew it was for a good reason, you knew it wasn't going to last long, you knew it wasn't anything else. Now, the same prick, if you weren't expecting it, um, you would really attend to much more and might, uh, might produce a startle response and really want to know what was wrong if you felt that same sensation in a completely different context. So your brain is always setting the scene for the messages that come in from your body. It's not just reacting to them, it's actually setting the level. And um, we can actually see the effects of placebo suggestions in the spinal cord. It changes function in the spinal cord to be told you're having something that will help with your pain. And it quietens down the messages coming in because the brain's saying, it's okay, I'm being treated for this, I know I'm going to be all right, it's nothing worrying, so I can damp down the sensations. Completely different to if an unknown pain quite a severe one, starts, you don't understand why, you don't know what it is, um, then your brain is going to really amplify all those sensations in order that you pay maximum attention to it until you've resolved what it is. So the brain processes pain wherever it's from and whatever it's due to in the same way. And parts of the brain obviously locate it, you always know where the pain is, you, you don't sort of feel pain and not know where it is, although in some parts of the body it's quite hard to point to it. In, in, uh, in guts, for instance, it's quite hard to tell exactly where it is because that's the way we're wired. Um, but at the same time, uh, pain always alerts areas that pay attention and so switch attention away from other things towards the pain and that deal with threat and anxiety. So there's always a, a threat in pain and there's always a need to, to deal with that threat, to answer the questions that it asks. And at the same time, in the front of the brain, which are areas which deal with control and so on, part of that control is the start of inhibition. So in my example of the blood test, you know you're going to have a blood test, you know the procedure, you're ready for it, you're not bothered about it. Um, your, the, the frontal lobes will be sending messages down saying, this is fine, you needn't even attend to it very much. Um, conversely, <laughs> you know, if you have no idea what it, what it is, the frontal lobes will, will be saying, this could be really worrying, it could be really important. Um, I need to hear everything that's going on in your body uh, around that area in order that we can sort this out. 
So your brain is very, very active all the time in relation to pain. And that's why psychology is important. Now, I think we're a long way from mobilizing the powers of the brain in relation to pain. There are some amazing yogis, monks uh, who have, Buddhist monks who have meditated since they were small children, who are very good at overriding all pain. But as far as I know, none of us is like that. None of us is a Buddhist monk. None of us has meditated from when we could barely walk. Um, but those powers are there, and we really need to be get a, getting better at activating them. So pain is always an emotional experience. The anxiety, the threat is there. It's full of meaning, and it's not just the immediate meaning of what is this, what, what's happening to me, but is this going to stop me doing the things I want? Is this going to stop me doing things with my family, uh, getting to work, traveling, uh, doing my hobbies? Those are really important. And of course, the longer the pain goes on, the more it does impact on daily life. Even simple things like, is it going to stop me lifting my arm so that I can brush my hair? Well, who's going to do it for me if I can't? And sometimes those things are treated as trivial, but they're not at all trivial, because if you don't feel fit to go out, then that starts affecting a whole lot of other areas of life. And so what psychology focuses on is not necessarily so much the pain itself, but the attention we, we pay to pain and the emotional meaning for us. And if we can take the threat out of pain, then we can tolerate it much better. We can free our attention to go back to the things we were doing, the conversations we're having or the work we're doing or whatever it is. So we're all different as well in the way we process pain. Um, our brains are wired differently. They're wired differently because of uh, differences right from childhood. How you were treated as a small child by your parents and how you treat your children affects their brain wiring. And if you have very efficient, very strongly wired pathways to the control areas, it's easy to exert control on your pain than if they're quite thin and, and rarely used, as it were. But they grow through life. They grow and they get pruned. The ones that don't get used get pruned and uh, go away. And the ones that you do use, even completely new pathways will start to strengthen. So you, when you're changing the way you deal with things, you're also changing the structure of your brain. So what affects pain in terms of psychology? Well, of course, fear and anxiety and worry. Um, the classic example is someone who wakes in the night, middle-aged man, perhaps a bit overweight, um, has pain in his chest, uh, thinks it must be a heart attack, rushes off to hospital, has an ECG, is told his heart's perfectly fine, um, that he has, um, he has a, a gastric problem which is you know people often do turn up in in uh, the emergency room with with those thinking it's a heart attack he's reassured he goes home and he can go to sleep the pain is still there the meaning has entirely changed from being life-threatening to being something that just needs some attention and he can even go to sleep with the pain so knowing what it is is so important in, in starting to be able to deal with it. It's worse when the pain stops you doing the things you want to do, and when it reminds you of related problems, when it starts to proliferate into other areas, for instance, of NF, that are affecting your life. And when it constantly interrupts, you inter interrupts your trains of thought, your conversations, your sleep, um, just breaking in all the time, and that's the that's the warning function of pain. It's, we're wired so that it breaks in and, and demands our attention. What matters is what we do next when it's done that, when it's interrupted us. Do we then switch into fretting about it, thinking about it, going over all the possibilities again? Or do we say, actually, it's OK. I know what this is. I'm dealing with it as best I can. I've got a good team working, you know, medical t team working with me. Um, I can go back to thinking about other things. 
So what helps pain psychologically? Well, knowing what's wrong, feeling able to cope with it. Many people who deal with pain, really persistent pain, all day, every day, or you know, intermittently, but over a long time, they'll tell you all the things they can't do and don't do. And then when you start to explore what their daily lives are about, you realize how much they do manage to do. I've seen lots and lots of people with uh, young adults with chronic pain, and they say, I'm a hopeless parent, I'm not looking after my children properly. And I ask what they mean by that. And they, you know, a man might say, oh, I can't play football, or I can't pick my children up, or a woman talking about not being able to walk her children to school, or take them to the playground or whatever. And then when I ask the things they do do with their children, they spend a lot of time with them. They, they're always there for their homework. They're perhaps home more than they would be if they were able to go out to work. There are plenty of things they do with their children. But of course, because they're upset about the things they can't do, those are what their focus is. So people often don't realize all the things they're doing to cope with it. And the more you realize what you are doing and are coping with, the more confidence that gives you to deal with the difficult bits. Having support from medical staff is important, and from friends and family, and from the wider community. And, you know, I've heard in the questions quite a lot of people grappling with lack of understanding in, you know, in schools and in other places. So the definition of pain is an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience, so always emotional as well as sensory, associated with actual or potential damage or described in terms of such damage. So whether there's an identifiable tumor, there's something pressing, or nothing can be found, if someone says they have pain, they have pain. And that's the only person who can say how bad it is. There's nothing we have to image pain. So pain can't be confirmed or denied by, uh, by those sort of investigations, although one should always look for a cause because the cause may be treatable and then one hopes the pain goes away. In children who can't tell us about their pain, it's really important we look more at their behavior. And this is a neglected area, although it's one that's increasing. It also applies when people have cognitive impairment at any time in life, and particularly in elderly people who may be dementing and who often have a lot of causes of pain but can't necessarily tell us about it. So very important to be alert to changes in behavior that might indicate pain. These are the sort of scales we ask people to fill in to tell us about their pain. And unless we ask them to tell us, we can't tell if treatments work. But of course, they're a very crude way of trying to measure pain. Here's a 0 to 10 scale, and we've got the same. It can be done in any language, of course. Um, this is one often given to children. To be honest, it's not a terribly good one, because children often pick the smiley face on the left, because that's the one they like. <laughs> And, you know, fair enough from their point of view, but that can mean that their pain doesn't get assessed properly because that's the one for no pain. Um, and then there's a, there are simple verbal ones as well that quite often people prefer if they have a cognitive impairment. Um, so, and, and of course, these things can be asked verbally. And also measured, as in the uh, trial examples you heard, is the impact of pain. I'm sorry, I don't suppose you can read this, and nor can I <laughs> from here. Um, but it's items asking children about, the first one is asking, does the pain make it difficult for you to do schoolwork? And the answers go from not at all to completely. So you can see how this way you can start to put um, amounts on how much pain interferes with people's lives, and that's terribly important. So what do we know about pain in NF? Um, we know that even with analgesics, it isn't completely fixed, and it does interfere quite a lot with daily life, and seems to be a cause of feeling quite low, not necessarily clinical depression, although it may be, but certainly feeling low, feeling unmotivated, um, things seeming a huge effort, and life looking rather bleak. For children and adolescents, um, anxiety and social problems were particularly important predictors of quality of life. And of course, issues about stigma at school, 
about disfigurement, um, particularly adolescents can often uh, feel that something which is actually not terribly noticeable to other people seems an enormous barrier to them. Um, and of course, if it's painful as well, that'll keep reminding them of it. Um, worse disease severity tends to predict poorer quality of life. That's not always the case. Um, for adults, uh, disfigurement was a particularly important issue in terms of their overall quality of life and worry about disease progression. Now, those of you who are parents of children with NF, you do the worrying for them quite a lot of the time. And as they get older, of course, they worry for themselves too. But I think these things go very much across the, the span. So the aims of any pain treatment first are to try to control the pain. And that often means a whole lot of experimenting with drugs, uh, not always obvious ones, not always ones that are primarily designed for pain. They may be uh, antidepressants are much used in pain at a different dose than for depression and with no uh, implication that it's because of depression that people have pain. That, that doesn't make sense. Um, but they do actually have an analgesic, they can have analgesic properties. Um, so there are a lot of drugs that need to be tried and again, only the person with pain can say if they're working or not. But if people are worried about their pain and what it means, then if they're taking analgesics and get pain relief, that doesn't necessarily deal with the worry. And sometimes they become more worried because they feel they're covering up signs that they should be attending to. So one also needs to think beyond pain relief to what else uh, needs addressing. Um, so helping people to understand the problem, very important. Um, finding ways to reduce the impact of pain on everyday life, and that might be rehabilitation, physiotherapy, might be psychology, often a mix of the two, maybe surgery. And these things need to go together. Very often they're done in, in sequence, and it's only when people are still unhappy after one treatment that they're offered another. But they, it, it makes more sense to offer them together. So rehabilitation is given straight after surgery. And help managing pain might even be given before. Reducing distress associated with pain, which I'll talk more about, and reducing some of the effects of pain on family and friends who are often very, very overshadowed by it. And of course, patient organizations have made huge, huge changes here. And we often talk to people about their relationships with their, with their healthcare team. If they're good, um, it's usually very clear early on but if they're not good, we try to help advocate and intervene because if people don't trust um, the people looking after them or don't feel cared for, then it's very hard to proceed. So, um, of course, many of you have, have tried uh, analgesics and you know the problem is always one's trying to balance against side effects and risks. But we often find that patients um, underuse analgesics that might really help them because they're worried about addiction. Of course, that's, that's a problem, and n l though less a problem than dependence, which is not the same as addiction. I don't want to go into all that, but people often overestimate those risks um, and uh, assume that any analgesics are addictive, some just aren't. Um, so people may be using them more cautiously than they need. On the other hand, there's a big problem with overuse of painkillers. And we find that's quite often because they have helpful side effects. They help people sleep. They often damp down their anxiety. And people welcome those side effects. And so it's tempting to use the drugs more for those side effects than for the analgesic effects. And that can often push them over a safe dose. So. Um, it's helpful to find if people are using painkillers for those problems because then we can say, okay, well, let's try and deal with those problems another way, work on sleep, work on anxiety, rather than just disregarding them. So understanding the pain is really, really important. I know I've emphasized that. Um, good sources of information are uh, multiple, although it can be hard 
because the more sources you go to, the more things can seem to contradict and sometimes really do contradict. Um, the web is, has lots of good information, has lots of rubbish. It's not always easy to distinguish between the two. Um, and then reducing the effects of pain on your life. Just talking about the pain often doesn't make for change. It can be temporarily quite a relief to unburden oneself, but it doesn't usually make changes. It's actually trying to do things differently and whether that the doing things is talking to yourself differently uh, and approaching the pain differently or actually physically doing things differently. Uh, building skills and confidence in managing pain across different problems and then practicing those new skills. So reducing the anxiety, um, worry about disease progression seems to be a very significant problem in, in NF. And of course, pain does have many possible meanings and if one, every time the pain increases or comes on when it wasn't there before, if one's head fills up with these worries, then it's very hard to carry on with anything else. Dealing with that anxiety uh, means you need to know where you stand, um, having checkups, and knowing what to do next. And I was really taken with this card that Roz showed that's given out in the clinic because it's just such a clear, easy checklist of what you should attend to. And then on the other side is who you should ring you know, something you can carry at any time just makes clear. Actually having aids like that makes people feel they can, as it were, outsource their worry. So they don't need to worry because they know they've got something to do about the worry when it gets to a level they can't stop ignoring it. So very helpful to have those kind of reminders. Um, people talk a lot about reassurance and, I mean, Doctors talk a lot about reassurance and other healthcare workers. Um, reassurance only works if it's reassuring. <laughs> and very often people define it. They say, I reassured the patient. Well, actually, the patient wasn't reassured. It has to be well-informed. It has to be relevant. It has to be personalized. And it often isn't. So this needs to be a developing partnership. Reducing depression. Um, Depression is often a lot about the future, assuming that the present is bad and the future is going to be even worse. Um, and it can be about loss. It can be about loss of things you enjoyed doing. It can be about loss of your health and confidence in your health in general. Um, and of course the losses are real, but through our lives we suffer losses of important people, of other things, and often deal with them very well. So we need to understand why we get stuck on certain losses and um, how we can replan the future. And in pain, we often talk to people about if the way they see the world is that pain is stopping them doing everything, it's like a wall right around them, then of course they can't imagine anything good on the other side. Um, and they only focus on getting rid of the pain as a way to getting some future. But if they see the pain as, it may be a wall, and it may be a pretty high and wide one, but if they can find a way around it, if they can see that there are other ways to tackle problems, and they may well have a, a better future than they imagine with the pain still there, then they can start to focus on those other problems. So even just ways of visualizing it can start to make a difference. The other thing to really realize about depression and depressed mood is your memory plays tricks on you. It gives you back the things you're unhappy about, the things you regret, the things you don't feel you do well, and it gives them back in lots of detail and technicolor. And the successes in your life, the strengths and so on, it's quite reluctant to <laughs> make those available to you. So when you, when you weigh things up, you're not able to weigh them up fairly, and that's why it can be really helpful to work with someone else, whether it's a counselor or a friend or something, to really get things in balance, because depression distorts that balance in a way that you can't easily control. So this is just an example from a very nice study um, that talked to people with NF. Two men, both with NF of moderate severity, 
and one said, I think all the time about where they might grow next. My eyes, my brain, I'm helpless. Well, even just hearing that makes you feel a bit grotty, doesn't it? Um, and another said, the NF is always at the back of my mind, so he's not pretending he can forget or ignore it, but not at the front of my mind. I get on with things. So he's realistic. This is not about fooling yourself that life is wonderful, um, but he's managing. Of course, you can't just force that change in thinking in yourself. It needs work, and it needs consolidation. And some of that consolidation is in your brain. So it's going from feeling like that to feeling like this. Psychology comes in, in various flavors. Different ones suit different people. Talking about your thoughts and feelings may work better for some people. Actually trying things out and reflecting on it may work better for others. And some are more meditative and um, talking about the meaning of life and so on. And what I think is really important is that whatever you... And then there are more analytic models and personality models, which, to be honest, haven't really offered anything to pain. What I'm talking about are the ones with evidence that they work. Um, and they do work. They make a bit of difference to pain intensity, but a lot of difference to distress and worry, and a lot of difference to the quality of life. And those gains last. And they're at least as good as drugs, sometimes better. What's really important is it's integrated in your medical treatment, and it's done by somebody who knows about NF. And to be honest, if that's a psychologist, 99% chance you're going to have to educate them a lot about NF first. And that, the, those data come from good reviews. So thank you very much. Amanda, thank you. That's a really wonderful talk. I think I've learned a lot about it. I'd just like to point out that University College London doesn't have a C by it, but um, <laughs> it looks good. Um, I think you've raised some really complex issues, and I hope everybody is going to have the opportunity, who wants to, to come and sit with you at lunchtime. So um, is there one burning question that somebody has for Amanda at the moment? The lady there. I'm Penny Brooks. Um, my daughter has an F1, and I'm also a palliative care and or hospice nurse. And I want to just let everybody know that that is a palliative care is a very distinct um, um, treatment, although the modalities can be the same. They're very different, so, or I mean separate. So make sure your doctor has a, a nervous, a specialty in palliative care. And, and I'd like to add that palliative care really um, is, is um, uh, one of the earliest models of well-integrated treatment of needs across the spectrum that patients brought, and I think pain gained a lot from it. Just a quick question. Are you, have you done much with the genetic testing for pain medicines? I know they have these genetic panels now, and, and so you can then... You know, part of the challenge is as a patient, you go in to see a doctor and they only give you a certain, certain amount of pain medicine, but if you have the genetic testing that shows that you're a poor responder, you can use that as evidence. Does that come into play at all in your work? Um, well, I'm not really qualified to answer that, not being uh, a medic, but um, although we know something about uh, the genetics of pain, it's pretty complex, and at the moment it's not giving us any help with treatment. I mean, apart from the fact that some people don't respond to um, things like codeine at all, so you've got people who do respond and don't respond. On mean, you know, it looks like it's in the middle, but some things people don't respond to at all. Um, but to be honest, even when we think we've defined disease very well, I mean, the type of pain well, and the apparently appropriate drugs are given, um, which may or may not link with a, a genetic basis, uh, it doesn't always work as expected. And so people are still having to try drugs over, you know, g cycle through the different ones in different doses. It's a long process. <laughs>